Good, happy Monday morning to everyone. Good to be back here. Uh, hope you're uh, going to start off to have a good, good week this week. Um, news and notes. Um, if you had not gotten a chance to watch or look, please note that we have uh, restarted our weekend Bible study Saturday night on the book of Revelation and Sunday morning on the book of Exodus. And interesting enough, both of them are at chapter 12. Um, we started them up this past weekend, and we've put them up on the church Facebook page, so you may watch them from at home. Um, I do have a, uh, a study that I've done. I'm working on doing translation work on the book of Revelation, and I'm going to try and make sure I've got it somewhere. If you want a copy of it before I get it up published somewhere, uh, let me know, and I can send you a, a copy of it via Facebook Messenger or what have you. So, uh, with that being said, it is time for our daily devotion. Today is August 17th. It's also Johann Gerhardt, theologian, who is one of the, the great third-generation Lutherans, one of the, uh, probably the most would consider the, the leading Lutheran theologian of the beginning of the 17th century. So, um, we'll mention him in our prayers, I'm sure, at the end. But let's begin with our normal opening, page 295, the order of morning prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. In the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. My mouth is filled with your praise and with your glory all the day. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Today's psalm is Psalm 24, verses 1 through 6. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. I want to look at that very quickly, because this is really neat theology here that, that we might skip by. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in his holy place? Who is going to get to come to the temple of the Lord? He who has clean hands, clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. How do you get clean hands and a pure heart? Well, you get clean hands by being made clean by God. You get a pure heart by being purified by God. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. And yeah, got it. And why for? Why does God cleanse and purify us? He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. We hear blessing, and often we jump very quickly to material stuff. But literally, the word bless, both in Hebrew and Greek, means to speak good upon. So what happens? You are forgiven. You enter the house of God. You hear good words spoken to you. Good is spoken to you and of you, and you receive righteousness. No, he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. You receive righteousness from God when he speaks his good word to you. It's not like we Lutherans are making this stuff up. It's all over the place in the Psalms. So, having said that, let's move on to 1 Corinthians. We're going to start off in the middle of chapter 9, towards the end, actually. 1 Corinthians 9.24, and we're going to read through 10.22. So, St. Paul writes, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. But I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. For I want you to know, brothers, 
that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and they all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things took place as examples for us, that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did, and were destroyed by serpents, and were grumbled as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example. But they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation is overtaking you that does not come to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be enabled to endure it. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Consider the people of Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices participant in the altar? What do I imply then? That food offered to idols is anything, or that an idol is anything? No. I imply that what pagan sacrifice they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participant with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When Paul talks about various temptations that can come across us, the ways in which we might be stumbled, the very first one he runs to is idolatry. And that strikes us as strange as modern 21st century people because we're very sophisticated and we all live in a monotheistic culture. So the, the question is, uh, do you believe in God? You're either a, a, a monotheist who believes that there is a God, or you're a, an atheist who believes that there are, is no God, or, or you might be agnostic and say you don't know. We don't deal with pagan idolatry anymore. What is the first commandment? You shall have no other gods before me. What does this mean? We should fear and love and trust, fear, love, and trust in God above all things. The point comes in that anything that we put on par with God or place above God is an idol. It is a, a creature, something that God created that we end up wanting to love or trust or fear more than God. And the example that he gives for, for idolatry is not so much people wanting to... Uh, go ignore God, but just wanting to participate in the normal things of life. Corinth was a fascinating town, and it was full of all sorts of uh, temples and such like that. And really, they were one of the main places where you would engage in social activity, where you could be part of a community, where you could go along to get along. And this is one of the things that I think is still something that we face today and face very much. What are you willing to do to go along and get along with everyone out there? Um, I'll use the silly example from school. If the popular kids are picking on the kids, do you pick along with them or do you defend them, speak well of them, and put the best construction on everything? We can fear what people might say of us because if we defend them, they might turn on us. Or we might love being with the popular people. Or we might think that being in with good peers and, and being with the popular kids is the way that we get by in life. Ah, ha, ha, oh, that's so talking about junior high day. Now look at how we deal with life today and who we make friends with in business and 
who we socialize with and how we gain power and prestige. As horrific as junior high was, it actually was just preparation for the real world. It's just, we often forget it. And we are tempted to make idols of so many things, of wealth, of power, of prestige, of the government. Uh, this is one of the things that's really being pushed now, I would argue, that as more and pe more people uh, do not have faith in God, even a God, not to, to say nothing of the true God, um, there's more and more faith placed upon the, the state. We can act when the state tells us it's safe to act. The state will keep us safe. They'll make sure that we get a vaccine and we won't all die. We're all going to die anyway. That's why it's good to have a God who says, yeah, I, I will die with you and I'll ride with you and you're okay. And in fact, here, take and eat, take and drink. This is my body. This is my blood. You participate in me and you are all together joined into me and I am with you wherever you go and you are with me wherever you go, even beyond this life. Profound thing. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of that one bread. The highest reality that we have is that we are united to Christ, rede redeemed, forgiven, washed clean, pure. We receive the blessing of God. We are prepared for life now and life everlasting in Christ. It is ours now. And the temptation that Satan will throw and that our flesh rings up is that we're not satisfied with that. We want something else. We think that's not good enough in the moment. It's nice that I'm a Christian and all, but right now uh, the, the, the popular people are picking on this thing. Or this is trending on Facebook or Twitter or, or everyone's sharing this or we're all doing that type of stuff. And it drives us. And it can drive us away from Christ. So again, be focused on where you are, where you exist. You are in Christ. Rest in him. And yes, the world is scary out there. And yes, the world will try to do its worst to harm you and do bad things to you. What did it do to Jesus? Well, if you forget, there's a big giant cross behind there. And guess what the church is going to do? It's going to do its best to try to kill you. And in fact, eventually you will die. So be it. <clears throat> I can't do raspberries when people are here because that's no longer sanitary. But I can do it when you're just online. <clears throat> Even though we die, yet we shall live. That's the reality of it. And that's where we need to remain. And when we are in Christ, we have such freedom. We don't have to demand anything. We're free to live. We're free to be bold and caring and loving for our neighbor. We're free to be generous because God takes care of stuff for us. And we're simply his children, his people, and we live securely. My, uh, my son was riding his bike around. He was peeking in, looking in. He's looking confidently because he knows I'm not going to like, Rrr! he's free to go be a goober. And then we're going to go to the grocery store later on and he'll be free to ask me for random stuff. And some I'll say yes and some I'll say no. Some I'll say no. The feeling I might come home with fried chicken for dinner. But there's confidence and security. Your confidence and your security is in Christ Jesus. Why? He's done everything for you. It's all good in him. Don't let Satan knock you off of Christ. So, having said that, let's go on to our, our uh, Augsburg Confession lesson. We're going to look at Article 22 of both kinds in the sacrament. And really, the... Um, the point of this section, uh, of this part, the rest of the uh, Augsburg Confession, is that they're looking at things that they are doing differently. Yes, these are things that over the past 10, 12 years, we have changed how we're acting in Wittenberg. But here's why. And here's why these are solid changes to make. So, the first one is of both kinds, i.e. of receiving both the Lord's body and the Lord's blood in the sacrament. To the laity are given both kinds in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, because this usage has the commandment of the Lord in Matthew 26. Drink ye all of it, 
where Christ has manifestly commanded concerning the cup that all should drink. And lest any man should craftily say that this refers only to priests, Paul in 1 Corinthians 11, which we'll get, I think, tomorrow or the day after, recites an example from which it appears that the whole congregation did use both kinds. And this usage has long remained in the church, nor is it known when or by whose authority it was changed, although Cardinal Cosianus mentions the time when it was approved. Cyprian, in some places, testifies that the blood was given to the people. The same is testified by Jerome, who says the priests administer to the Eucharist and distribute the blood of Christ to the people. Indeed, Pope Galatius commands that the sacrament not be divided. In his De Consecration, only custom, not so ancient, has it otherwise. But it is evident that any custom introduced against the command of God is not to be allowed, as the canons witness. But this custom has been received not only against Scripture, but also against the old canon and the example of the church. Therefore, if any preferred to use both kinds of the sacrament, they ought not to have been compelled with offense to their consciences to do otherwise. And because the division of the sacrament does not agree with the ordinance of Christ, we are accustomed to omit the procession which hitherto has been in use. In the Reformation, when talking about the Lord's Supper, there were three errors that Luther pointed to, three main things that Rome did wrong. Uh, the first was the, 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 the cup, the chalice, was denied to the laity, that only the priest received the Lord's blood. If you, were, if you were just a common person, you would just get the Lord's body and that was enough for you. And that really got enmeshed in the custom by 1215. And there are various historical reasons for it and stuff like that, but they were all dumb. and They were all attempts to be very practical, forgetting that our Lord Jesus Christ said, take and eat, take and drink. Um, the other two were, uh, we didn't like transubstantiation simply because it was a bunch of philosophical gobbledygook, goop, and you don't make people believe a philosophical theory. And then the third is we rejected the idea of the sacrifice of the Mass. The Lord's Supper is not us re-sacrificing Jesus or offering up an unbloody sacrifice. It is Christ giving himself to us. The Lord's Supper is coming to us. Interestingly enough, Rome now agrees with this. Um, it has been the custom since Vatican II for the distribution of both kinds in the sacrament to be allowed. And in fact, throughout uh, the vast majority of the Roman Catholic Church, at least in uh, the Western world, that, that's, that's what now is going on. And so this is actually one of the points of the Augsburg Confession where even Rome now says, yeah, the Lutherans were right. It does serve as a warning. There are often times when we do things with the best, intent, best of intentions. If I am being charitable and looking at the history of the medieval church, I will say that they moved to... Uh, distribute in one kind with just the best of intentions. The problem is they thought their intentions were better than what God says. And that is a warning to us that, uh, that we should not place our own intentions over what God has said. And that'll come up next time, because tomorrow we're going to look at the marriage of priests. And that's a fun history. So how long do they have? Is that our... Yeah, okay, we'll break that up into at least two chunks. But yeah, the, the history of the marriage of priests and the prohibition thereof is one of my favorite stories in the history of the church. So, um, and we'll look at that more tomorrow. So, with that being said, let us confess the faith, and then we'll pray, and then we'll go and be about our day. So, let us uh, confess. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. For our prayers on Monday, we are instructed to uh, pray for faith to live in the promises of holy baptism, for one's calling and daily work, for the unemployed, for the salvation and well-being of our neighbors, for schools, colleges, and seminaries, for good government, and for peace. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that by the gift of holy baptism, you have called us out of darkness and your marvelous light, that you have made us your heirs, that you have made us your children. And yet you have left us in this world to show forth your love, to be instruments of your care, your peace, your concern, and your provision. We ask that you would bless us this day as the normal tasks of the week begin to unfold before us. Keep us safe in our comings and goings. Fill us with love, charity, and devotion for our neighbor that we might be diligent in our work, that we might be fair in our dealings, that all that we say and do would be pleasing your sight, and that we would be of benefit to our neighbors. We ask that you'd be with those who are currently unemployed, those whose lives have been utterly disrupted, whether just by chance or whether because of the results of this pandemic. Grant them peace, grant them safety, find reasonable and uh, beneficial ways of supporting them, and also raise up for them opportunities to love and care. Help them to be creative in finding ways to show love and concern to the people you have placed in their lives. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing upon our schools, especially uh, the schools here around in Illinois as we prepare to return to class. Bless the teachers and administrators. Grant that they might be wise in coming up with ways to properly teach and educate the children. Uh, be with them as they face difficulties and new strange situations as a result of the current pandemic. And give them wisdom in figuring out how best to meet the educational needs of these children in a way that is safe. Be with the children, give them rest and uh, recuperation as they enjoy the last vestiges of summer. And prepare them for diligence and learning, especially as uh, learning will be diff different and difficult for them. Grant your diligence to parents and guardians who, who look after these children and help them to aid and further the instruction of the young. Be also with those who are returning to college. Keep them safe in their comings and goings and help them to be diligent in their studies. Bless especially those freshmen who are beginning college and are moving away from home. Uh, keep them in the care of your hand. Give them wisdom and discernment that they might not fall off into a uh, various tomfooleries that can happen and are easily now accessible to them. But help them to grow in maturity. Use this as a time of blessing that they might understand more and more your love for them and the wisdom of your guidance. Heavenly Father, look upon the government of our land with your favor, our local government, our state government, our federal government. You know the trials and divisions that we face, the difficulties that our leaders have before them. We ask that you give them patience, discernment, and wisdom. So they might make decisions that are beneficial and not merely for political gain. Heavenly Father, these things we place before you. We ask that you would give them all, that you would grant healing and peace and health upon our land for all who are in need. We lift them up to you not for the sake of our own worth, but on account of Christ Jesus, who has died not only for us, but for all the people for whom we pray. Grant them physical health and safety and daily bread according to your will, and pour out your spirit upon them that they might come to know not only you as the source of their earthly blessing, but also Christ as their Savior from sin. In his name we pray. Amen. All right. Concluding prayers. Prayer of the day. Most high God, we owe you great thanks that in the sacred mystery of the supper you feed us with the body and blood of your Son. May we approach this heavenly meal with the true faith, firmly convinced that the body we eat is the one given unto death for us, and the blood we drink is the blood shed for our sins. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Concluding prayers. Almighty God, merciful Father, who created and completed all things, on this day when the work of our calling begins anew, we implore you to create its beginning, direct its continuance, and bless its end that our doings may be preserved from sin, our life sanctified, and our work this day be well-pleasing to you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We pray. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, 
that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. All right, everyone. I want you all to take care. Have a good day. All that good stuff. And I will see you guys later. Have a good one. Keep college students in your prayers. It, it, it's always weird going back to co going to college anytime. It's going to be extra, like extra cheese weirdness on that pizza. So uh, keep them in your prayers. Have a good one, everyone. Bye.